Boom, and we are back continuing where we left off. Uh, Assassin's Creed Discovery Tour. Um, yeah, let's get into it. Daily life. Almost done. Uh, again, as a quick warning that uh, some of this stuff might be boring, so I'll just skip over it. And if you want to find out more about it, definitely pick up the game. Uh, it's just like Call of Duty's multiplayer where sometimes people pick up the original, not to play the story, but to play the uh, bonus content. And this is one of those games, because I actually didn't like the story. Okay. Welcome to Building Ancient Egypt. Well, that's kind of cool. Constructed with bricks made of mud, most ancient Egyptian buildings were not permanent. Only religious temples and funerary monuments were meant to stand the ravages of time. For these very important structures, Egyptians used limestone, sandstone, and harder materials, such as granite, quartzite, and travertine. These heavy stone blocks were so prized that they were often transported from quarries located hundreds of kilometers away. Oh, makes sense as to why you hardly find that stuff now. Limestone was common and easy to extract from quarries on the east bank of the Nile. This particular limestone had marine fossils in it, however, preventing it from being easily decorated and polished. Used uh, limestone, not so great. Ancient Egyptians preferred to use Told sedimentary you. rock beds We'd or be layers through like it. sandstone and limestone. Uh, nine to the architecture were often stuff. Easier to extract. Okay, what else? What else? Cutting Workers techniques. Ooh, this would be interesting. A large grid directly on the stone surface, taking care to leave a space between the blocks. Oh, no way. This allowed them to isolate the different blocks and create a trench that would make the extraction easier. Stone workers used iron chisels for hard rock and bronze or copper tools for softer rocks such as limestone. Wow, that's crazy. Removing material between each block created a trench line. In some quarries, that trench was wide enough to accommodate a worker who would then cut the block entirely on site. For harder rocks like granite, workers cut a series of holes and hammered wooden wedges into them. They then soaked the wood until it swelled and caused the rock to split. Wow, that's pretty ingenious. Uh, it's funny because like people always say like, oh, aliens and all that stuff. But like um, I went to a Graham Hancock lecture and uh, he's saying that like the the megalith structures, those those people are actually still building those megaliths to, to this day. So like it's just just because we can't conceive it with our technology doesn't mean they didn't know how to do it back in the day. You know what I'm saying? The gallery extraction technique was used when the desired rock was buried under layers of rubble. This method was often necessary in order to find the whiter and finer limestone required for a smoother finish. Okay, that's cool. To cut the stone, they created a longitudinal kerf mm. or slit and then cut the rock at a 90 degree angle. You know who I find would uh, enjoy the stuff? The Engineers. These mining pits over the course of quarrying, workers would leave support sections of unexcavated rock. I'm a marketer, not an engineer, so. In every quarry, dedicated shrines were established to offer protection oh, for that's the workers. Interesting. Okay. In particular, Circuit, the scorpion goddess, was considered a very powerful deity among quarry workers. Every mine and quarry of ancient Egypt included a scorpion charmer who was said to use magical powers to ward off the dangerous insects and keep the workers safe. Hmm, that's kind of cool. They kind of do that stuff in like Hong Kong and uh, Thailand, across Asia still, where they have these like little shrines built for um, built for deities to to give them good luck or protection and stuff. It's funny how we need to like like boost our boost ourselves and create like that placebo in order to motivate ourselves into like believing in something, you know? It's weird. It's weird. I'm not saying I don't do it. I do it all the time. Okay.
backup plan. Being lost that they would make a miniature beeswax model as a spare. Okay. Just in case. Don't want to go losing grandma. Welcome to Workers and Transport. So, as I was saying, um, you know, engineers, architects would find this stuff very interesting. I'm a marketer, so I prefer the psychology of it. Um, Eighth Sage would definitely, definitely love playing this game for the pyramid section. So, if he ever plays it in live streams, check that one out because I. Will not be playing the architecture stuff. Here we go. Boom. Whether workers were employed for the pyramid construction or at the quarries, the government supplied food and housing. Workers for the pyramids and royal necropolises were housed in more permanent villages, such as the famous Dar. Okay, makes sense. Skilled architects and engineers were employed year-round while support labor were often farmers who worked on the quarries or construction during the Nile's flood season. The basic laborers were hardworking and versatile. Many may have been farmers who joined the construction during the off-season. Hieroglyphs found in the work villages listed assigned job titles. Hmm, cool. Do you see him fall there? Archaeological research shows that no food was stored or prepared on site. But instead, workers received abundant rations of bread, beer, and meat. Oh, bread, beer. These mm. rations were taken care of by an administration outside the village. Medical treatment was also available for those who were injured. Hmm, that's cool. While some quarries were close to the Nile, others were located across the desert and required long expeditions. These expeditions were sanctioned by the state. They involved complex logistics and required many participants. Transporting a block by land meant that workers had to overcome the weight and friction of the load. To solve this, they first dug a track in the ground. This path was sometimes reinforced with rails upon which a sled, used to ferry the blocks, would be pulled. Okay, so they just pulled a bunch of blocks. Whenever possible, blocks were toppled from a higher elevation onto the sled. Workers then poured water onto the clay at the front of the sled, creating a slick surface to more easily move the load. Hmm, that's cool. During flood season, the Nile was at its largest and deepest, which allowed the transportation of the heaviest and biggest loads. Quarries close to the river had troughs dug out to deliver the stones to the shoreline. Harbors and wharfs situated at the river's edge allowed the transfer of materials and supplies. Harbor warehouses accommodated it. Hmm, it's kind of boring. The Uwadi al Jarf papyri detail a limestone load intended for the Khufu pyramid that weighed in at 70 to 80 tons, or 30 blocks. Yeah, this is Stone cargo more architecture generally stuff. weighed 15 tons per boat, amounting to roughly six or seven blocks per trip. River transportation was the most efficient way to ferry stone blocks between the quarry and the construction site. Blocks were transported by flotillas of several types of boats. The most detailed illustration of transport by river is a relief of Queen Hatshepsut's barge with an accompanying flotilla. Hmm, okay. Page turner that was not. Ooh, happily ever these days. Either party could initiate a divorce. No reason needed to be given. Oh, cool. So divorce was pretty, pretty okay back then. I want to fly around during the day, return to safety and modify my body at night. Oh, okay, cool. Here we go. Ooh, bye bye. Welcome to Agriculture and Seasons. Oh, okay, here we go. This could be interesting. What did they make? While crops were cultivated in different oases around the desert, most of the arable lands were near the Nile. Two types of cereal grain were cultivated, 
barley, and an ancient wheat known as emmer. These two key ingredients contributed in establishing bread and beer as the staple of the Egyptian diet and the basis of its economy. Wow, bread and beer. It's kind of funny that we, America went through prohibition. The Ptolemaic era created an agricultural revolution with the introduction of advanced agricultural techniques and new grain types such as rice, durum wheat, and pearl millet. The resulting agricultural mass production greatly increased the economy of ancient Egypt. It also prompted the development of storage and transportation, allowing long-distance trade with other regions. Hmm, that was, that was pretty fascinating. This is pretty cool. I like, I like this. Okay, this one's, this one's getting entertaining. Both bread and beer rations were part of a system of barter payment. The state used those goods to pay wages for those who worked in the quarries and at the construction sites. Mm. Beer was so important to ancient Egyptians, they had a goddess of beer brewing, Tenenet. Tenenet is seen in many paintings and sculptures with beer, and women are depicted as the primary beer makers. You know, it's funny, um, all animals get themselves drunk, like uh, we have beer. Um, I know there are some animals that will eat like fish to get in themselves order drunk, to increase poison. agricultural production, fertile land was divided into plots and large agricultural villages were encouraged. The state and temples were the biggest landowners. Depending on the region, fertile land was managed by civil servants or rented to individuals. Ancient Egyptians relied on rudimentary tools for land cultivation. Soil was broken down with hoes and wing plows were used to make furrows. Cool. The three seasons known as Aket, Peret, and Shemu corresponded to a specific phase of the agricultural process and the river's natural changes. Aket was the time of the flood, beginning with the appearance of the star Sirius in July. Peret was the time when lands were cultivated, plowed, and sown. This fell between October and November. Shemu ran from May to September and was when harvesting and taxation began. Hmm, cool. The Pharaoh's duty was to uphold order against chaos and provide for his people. Priests and local governors also wanted to appear as protectors of the people. However, any variation in the Nile seasons could cause water shortages. This had devastating consequences on wheat and barley crops. The pharaoh, administrators, and priests knew they needed to demonstrate their ability to prevent such a catastrophe from happening. And so they invented the story which would be inscribed upon the famine stela. That's kind of funny, uh, they're talking about order and chaos. There is no order in chaos, it's like paradoxical. You can have uh, direction in chaos. But even that's not inaccurate. It's the story funny. begins with the pharaoh worried for his people. The Nile hasn't flooded in years, and his people are starving. In search of the origins of the flooding, Djoser seeks out Kanum, the protector god of the region and the source of the drought. Djoser gives the god offerings and orders his priests to restore the temple of Kanum. These offerings please the god and the floods are restored. This story was intended to highlight the importance of the deity in everyone's daily lives, while also demonstrating the crucial role that the priests and the king played in feeding and protecting the people of Egypt. Mm, power through perception. I like it. Okay, let's go. Ooh, maybe we could finish off daily life today. Let's see. Temples, theaters, museums, and libraries. I like it. Not unlike today. Oh, that's cool. I've been doing the same stuff forever and ever, people.
It's like we're in one big sim. <laughs> Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Cult of... The new grain types of the Ptolemaic period required a great deal of water. Farmers needed to ensure they had effective, consistent irrigation. The Nile's rising and receding waters naturally irrigated most of the crops. Areas where the Nile didn't reach, such as gardens and vegetable plots, required an irrigation tool known as the Shadouf. The Shadouf allowed easy transport of water from its source. It consisted of a tall wooden frame with a long pivoting pole and suspended bucket. The system could be raised and lowered with little effort. Cool. Later, a Sakya, or water wheel, was invented. The Sakya needed animals to turn the wheel, which rotated buckets through the water. It drew the water to an elevation of 3.5 meters and enabled a great deal of control over the irrigation process. It's like a sprinkler. This improvement supplied larger areas and thus resulted in larger harvests. Hmm, that's cool. The threshing process separated the grain from its husk. Workers would spread the ears on clean ground. Oxen, cows, or donkeys were then guided back and forth to trample the grain. This continuous movement worked the grain loose while preventing the animals from eating it. Unwanted chaff and straw were swept away or gathered and added to the mud used to make bricks to make them stronger. Hmm. Winnowing was the stage where workers used wooden scoops to throw ears in the air. The wind carried off the chaff leaving the heavier seeds to fall to the ground. That's kind of cool. Transporting large amounts of grain required ships equipped to carry heavy loads. These goods were moved Basic during the farming Nile's teachings. flooding season, when the river was deep enough. Basic farming and spreading through Having water. Having reached Alexandria's inner harbor, the wheat was unloaded under the supervision of a civil servant in charge of wheat management. Portions were distributed to Alexandria's city market and the remaining stockpile was either basic farming techniques grain so storage learning. facilities were located across all of Egypt temples and institutions had large silos while individual houses had storage sheds so in some grain? houses arched cellars were built into the foundations these watertight chambers were accessible from the ground floor through a trap door Okay, so when the grain, grain was, was ready for processing, part it was life. poured into bowls and pounded into a coarse flour. That flour was then passed through a sieve to make it of finer quality and further ground between stones. Hmm. Ancient Egyptians did not stock flour. Instead, fresh grain was portioned out each time to produce flour as it was needed. Oh, well, that's cool. The sieves used by ancient Egyptians were unable to filter out sand and stones. Grit often passed into the flour, causing long-term tooth abrasions among oh. all classes of Egyptians. Rough. Okay, so be careful what you eat back in uh, ancient times. You know, chips and teeth. Dentistry bills are on, on high. Here we go. Leather and linen. Kind of cool. Smile. Nope. Can't take a photo. Uh, high turnover. Change of pace. It's lost time. Hmm. That's cool. Start the tour. Welcome to Leather and Linen in Ancient Egypt. Tanning, a process which dates from prehistoric times, was present although not highly valued in Egypt due to the heat. Leather was reserved mainly for things such as sandals, leather bags, 
dagger sheets, quivers, and other similar items. Hmm. That's cool. Leopard hides, unlike regular leather, were highly valued and usually worn by priests. Leopard hides. Okay. Must have been so hard to get. Gotta kill them. Well, technically, gotta kill all of them. But, yeah. Valued for its coolness and freshness in hot weather, linen was the fiber most commonly used for fabrics and textiles. It was produced from flax, which was plentiful in Egypt. Fibers were usually dyed before weaving. While color was used in the production of textiles, dyes weren't commonly used for clothing, and most Egyptians wore white. Huh. The color represented spiritual purity, a goal to reach for every day of one's mortal life. Wow, so they... Wow, what a really religious culture. They all sported something to remind themselves every day to do better. Cool. I like it. I like it. It's not like uh, the ties in Egypt. The monks wearing their uh, robes all day. Various shades were achieved using woad, a dye produced from the leaves of Isotis tinctoria. The plant was cultivated for this purpose within the Nile Delta and allowed for the creation of various colors. For example, different maceration times of the leaves would result in colors ranging from red to green, while adding in limestone shifted it to blue. RGB. During the Greco-Roman period, other ingredients were found, resulting in a wider range of colors. Oh, that's cool. This area's style is strongly influenced by the dye baths and tanneries of modern-day Fes in Morocco. This helped Ubisoft envision what such locations might have been like in ancient Egypt. While this tannery is within the city walls, back then they were often found outside the city boundaries. Hmm, the tanner's the chemicals. trade was considered off-putting by the Greeks, as all these operations resulted in noxious smells. Yeah, told you, smells. Cool, that was, that was pretty interesting, I like that. Oh, Egyptian fashion. That was a cool, uh, cool thing about the white. Didn't know that. Fascinating. Bloody birthright, ascension throne, bloody venture. Down the side of the pyramid. Oh, that's cool. Slide down the pyramid. Oh. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Fashions. Ooh. Learning what life was like for ancient Egyptians presents many differences and yet also surprising similarities to how people might live today. Understanding the daily lives of regular citizens so many thousands of years ago is ultimately what connects us as human beings. That's what I'm saying. I like that. Jewelry was a popular item among ancient Egyptians of all social standing. Both men and women wore earrings, rings, and bracelets. Status determined how much jewelry a person wore and what it was made of. Just like today. Oh. The jewelry of the elite was made from gold, silver, and other precious stones. Because gold never lost its shine, it was considered akin to the flesh of the gods. Oh, wow. Cool. Wide jeweled collars were a favorite. Made with rows of beads formed into patterns of animals or flowers, the soft chiming sounds they made were thought to appease the gods. <laughs> it's always some spiritual reason. Though idealized, tomb paintings reason. are a catalog of the changing fashions of ancient Egypt from the Old to the New Kingdom. Egyptians took appearance and cleanliness very seriously and were diligent about their fashion, hair, and jewelry as well as their grooming habits. Hmm. Interesting. The fabric of ancient Egyptian clothing was almost entirely made from various grades of linen. Linen was commonly white, draped over the body and cinched at the waist though some garments were sewn or tailored wealthy men wore long tunics loincloths or kilts 
while poor men only wore loincloths. Cosmetics, including concoctions to prevent body odor and bad breath, were an integral part of everyday life for Egyptians. Hmm. Used by both men and women, cosmetics were used as moisturizing ointments and sun protection as much as for beautification. Red ochre, a natural clay, was the most readily available cosmetic to tint lips and cheeks. Henna was used on nails and lips and as hair coloring. It was also favored by richer women to decorate their palms and the soles of their feet. That's cool. Egyptians believed coal had magical powers, wearing it as black eyeliner to protect their eyes from the sun and to prevent eye infections from particles in the flooded Nile River. I don't know about all that. A special green coal made from green. Women and teenage girls wore their hair long and often braided. Wealthier women included carved combs or hairpins. The length of men's hair rarely dropped past the shoulders. They were mostly clean-shaven during the dynastic period, a trend began by the elite and soon adopted by the general populace. Queen Hatshepsut donned an artificial beard when she became pharaoh. That's funny. Wigs were very popular, used for special occasions or to conceal gray hair or baldness. They were fastened in place with beeswax. The most expensive wigs were made from human hair and reserved for royalty. Other wigs were composed of linen, wool, or animal hair. Hmm. Prepubescent children generally had their heads shaved. Young girls kept some strands intact, while young boys had a braid worn on the side. I wonder if that's for uh, lice reasons. Yeah. That's kind of cool. I like that. I like that. Artisans. So fascinating, you know, finding about human behavior, how it how it hasn't changed over time, you know. We're all still looking for the same stuff. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Artisans of Ancient Egypt. It was under the watchful eye of Ta of Memphis, the god of craft and architecture, that ancient Egyptians developed the unique rendition of the world they lived in. However, it is vital to understand that their view of art and those who created it was likely very dissimilar to the modern concept of the word. Instead of artists, the creative culture had skilled and respected artisans. The most significant categories of specialties for crafters were drawing, painting, sculpture, and metalworking. Mm, artisans. What's the difference? Ancient Egyptian craftspeople created both art and a wide variety of mundane, everyday tools. Every item created had a specific purpose and was produced by anonymous artisans who worked alone or with a team. Most crafts, such as pottery and metalworking, were utilized for everyday items. Luxury goods and artwork illustrations served temple rituals and were not meant for public display. Artisans rarely signed their names to the work, hmm. though they were clearly aware that they possessed a unique skill and talent for the task. Oh, interesting. It's almost like um, when everything's... Put together Art, what else can you do? forms has offered not only a practical insight into the way ancient Egyptians lived, but in how they viewed the world and their place in it. The balance of order and chaos was crucial in both the physical and the metaphysical universes. As a result, their art appears to follow a strict set of stylistic conventions that supported this worldview. From households and palaces to temples and tombs, pottery, papyrus and textile items were essential to the everyday life of ancient Egyptians. It's kind of cool. In ancient Egyptian culture, drawing was used as illustration, such as seen in the Book of the Dead. 
It was also the first step in the creation of a relief, painting, or statue. Two-dimensional representations were concerned with order and form, and were intended to honor gods and promote the transition of the soul to the afterlife. A lot of afterlife speak here. Crazy. Stylistically, Egyptians were concerned with the depiction of the human form's inner self. As such, artistic representations were not concerned with realism, but rather with idealized youth and perfectly harmonious visuals. Oh, so it's not about representing... That explains why they're like lions, because like in the inside he feels like a lion, you know? It's not about what he... he doesn't actually look like a lion. An exception to this were scenes depicting hunting and battle, where the environment and enemies moved in lively, even chaotic ways. Animals and foes were depicted piled up, as if describing chaos with Egyptians standing in solemn, disciplined poses, bringing order to the scene. Huh. <laughs> okay, the orders of chaos, I like it. Reliefs could be either in high relief or low relief. Either method required a surface suited to the desired technique. Preparation of the surfaces differed depending on the quality of the rock. A quarried block only needed a simple smoothing. Rough cut. Yeah, it's... For reliefs, preliminary sketches were drawn in red, then framed with a... Mm, no. Statues were believed to be vessels for the souls of the deceased, or deities. That is why a sculptor was called the one who makes it live. Oh, this divine that's cool. duty earned them the utmost respect. As with a relief, creation of a sculpture began with a drawing. Most statues were made of quarried blocks of stone, primarily limestone, though sometimes harder stones such as quartzite were also used. Very cool, very cool. In ancient Egypt, the profession of crafter was organized and relied on a specific hierarchy. Most At the domestic level, most Egyptians were craftspeople to a greater or lesser extent. The ability to repair tools was a daily necessity. Crafted everyday items could also be bartered for at the local market. Artisans with skills but lacking in resources worked at large estates, where the elite provided them with space to work and raw materials. The most skilled artisans were employed in royal or temple projects and benefited from a special status. They were provided with good workspaces and considered to be highly skilled. It's interesting, like, it seems that art played a big role back in Egyptian time, but I guess if, like, uh, all of your resources are met, like, you're not hungry or you're not cold, you know, your, like, baser needs, like, what else can you do except seek out self-actualization through art, you know? An ancient text known as the Satires of Trades has a number of descriptive summaries that offer teasing glimpses into how artisans were perceived. A coppersmith was said to stink and have fingers that resembled crocodile droppings, while potters were said to be like those who lived in Ba. Okay, it's weird. Located near the Valley of the Kings, Deir al Medina was a settlement created by order of the king to honor the most skilled artisans. Its name translates as the... Archaeologists believe the site was home to skilled and respected artisans for over 400 years. It is considered one of the most important discoveries relating to Egyptian daily life. While much of the focus of Egyptian archaeology was on its kings and queens, it wasn't until the excavation of Deir al Medina that Egyptologists were given a valuable window into the community life of ancient Egyptian artisans. It's cool as they played, they put a lot of emphasis on artists. I like it. I like it. Being an artist myself. Oh, really? Huh. Welcome to Evolution of Pottery in Ancient Excavations all over Egypt 
have uncovered enormous quantities of pottery vessels of all shapes and sizes. The production of pottery was mainly confined to the outskirts of settlements due to the materials required and to keep the kiln. Okay, so... Pottery pots. was essential to ancient Egyptians' daily lives. It was... For water, yeah, I get you. Early pots were made from pinched or coiled clay. Chopped straw, ashes, and other minerals were added, and the mixture was then smoothed and decorated before being put in the oven. Pots were fired in bonfires or enclosed within a brick kiln. It makes sense, yeah. The potter's wheel was utilized during the Old Kingdom. Oh, that's cool. It's Pottery like became smoother and more polished, similar to river stones. It was decorated primarily in red pigment, with the black color achieved by exposing it to smoke. Hmm. Quartzite particles, which created the rich blue or green glazing, became common during the New Kingdom. Mediterranean. It's kind of like a meh episode. Like this segment's kind of bad. found anywhere, and were the most common canvas for writing or drawing, in comparison to the more expensive papyrus sheets. Named after their Greek description, Ostraca contained daily life records, letters, or could be drawn upon. Artists drew sketches for temples and tombs, or simply for leisure. That's cool. I get it. Pots are important. Yes, yes. Okay, last ones. I think Alexandria has got to be my, my favorite one so far out of all these. It's very fascinating to find out how people like civilizedly lived, you know? Civilized is not even a word, but civilly lived? You know what I'm trying to say. Found by Alexander the Great in 331 BCE. Plant protection. Contra Selfium. Welcome to the Ooh, here we go. Egyptian households. In pre-Greco-Roman culture, women were considered equal to men in many matters. They owned property, testified in court, could divorce and inherit. Until the Greeks and Romans restricted their rights, Egyptian women could take over their deceased husband's trade. Huh, matriarchy. Marriage contracts included mentions of allowances and items of value brought to the marriage by the woman, which would forever belong to her. Wow. Matri matriarchal society versus today's patriarchal one. Certain professions were open only to women, such as weaving or professional mourning, while others were available to both genders, including working as servants for the rich households. Social status did have an impact, though. The higher in status, the easier it was to obtain education and access different professions. That was a little weird. Professional mourning, so they'd cry. It's like Kim Jong Un's homes people. were generally composed of three rooms. First, there was the entrance, furnished with a small bench of brick, probably intended for a statue and protective divinity. Then there was the ceremonial room, meant to receive guests. The last room was either a bedroom or kitchen. Furniture consisted of basic chairs, chests, and storage. Tables were not used for family dinners. Instead, each individual had a small table of their own. Cool. I like how this guy's just chilling right here. He's relaxing after his work. Marriages were a social contract rather than a religious construct. Ooh. Family was vitally important to ancient Egyptians, and children were considered a blessing from the gods. The father, mother, and their children were the nucleus of the family, and cohabitation sometimes extended to mothers-in-law, sisters, aunts, and sisters-in-law. That's pretty cool. Contractual obligation. Societal. It's not religious. Interesting. That's a very, uh... It's a very nice perspective. Even perspective. Objective. Status and wealth played a large role in the style and size of ancient Egyptian homes. 
Commoners' houses were built with sun-baked mud bricks. Wealthier homes were often painted in white and decorated with various motifs. Mm, not unlike today. Town officials and the rich lived in mansions with numerous rooms that were luxuriously decorated. Only temples and tombs meant to last for all eternity were built with stone. Hmm, that's cool. I like that. Funeral stone inscriptions focused on the main member of a household. Encircling this person would then be a spouse, parents, and children, possibly even siblings. These stones were so structured because there were no surnames in ancient Egyptian culture. Parents and children were a sort of family tree, which allowed for the identification of the deceased. Mm. Okay, very similar to today. It's, it's really interesting, like she said in that last one, how if you just find out how people from the past lived, you'll see how similar we all are. It's like just human nature exercising itself. Nothing really changes, we just think it does. Welcome to Bread and... While the Mesopotamians invented beer, including using a straw to avoid the sediments and herbs, ancient Egyptians perfected the brewing method. Egyptian beer's quality was determined by alcohol strength, color, and flavor. During the Pharaonic era, beer was the most commonly used and important alcoholic beverage. The state and temples used it, along with bread, as payment to workers, and it was included on the lists of food offerings to the gods and the deceased. That's cool. I wonder if it tastes like Coors Light. Beer was the Love popular drink of ceremonies and festivals. The festival of drunkenness was even dedicated to it. Considered to be quite nutritional, beer was also significant in the day-to-day -day lives of ancient Egyptians. Really nutritional. Egyptian adults and children consumed beer with all of their meals. Huh. And medical texts include hundreds of remedies that contain beer. It remained the most popular alcoholic beverage until the Roman era. Interesting. Recipes for beer varied over time and depended on the quality of the materials. Bakers and brewers typically worked alongside one another at the same workshop or house. Many families often produced the quantity appropriate to their own consumption, with better quality beers produced for festivals and others. Okay. Once baked, bread would be crumbled into the brew to start the fermentation process. Adding grain enzymes would break down the starches, turning them into sugar and creating a thick mat. Okay, so teach Once me how to make ready, beer right now. The bread and grain mixture was compressed and then strained through a sieve with water into the mix of malt beer. Once fermented, the beer mash was transferred to large containers and again compressed by foot or with pestles. This made me want to get some beer. Holy. Once smooth, the beer was stored in pottery jars and sealed with a clay stopper. It probably couldn't be kept for long and likely had a thick, pasty appearance. Okay, that's weird. While there are many ancient accounts for making bread, most of the knowledge known about ancient Egyptian brewing comes from an account by the alchemist Zosimos over 300 years after Cleopatra's reign. More recently, Dr. Delwyn Samuel, an archaeobotanist, has proposed alternate antique techniques to brew beer. However, experts are unable to replicate an authentic beer since not all of the techniques and ingredients used by ancient Egyptians are known yet. Okay, so it's going to be different Food than our beer. was on the floor until the Middle Kingdom when cooking benches were introduced. The introduction of durum wheat improved bread quality, meaning that the upper and middle classes ate better. The poor, however, still may do with a diet consisting of a gruel made of vegetables, softened bread, or barley. Dough was kneaded by hand or foot, and when sufficiently blended, additional items were added, such as fruits, nuts, honey, and spices. 
To leaven the bread, they added sourdough or leaven from beer brewing. More beer. All right, cool. Ancient Egyptians always had to fight off the omnipresent sand particles that were blown towards them. Despite their best efforts, sand regularly made its way into their food. Additionally, particles from the grain grinding stone tools and ovens they used also contributed to attrition and prematurely worn teeth. Oh, too bad. The team tried to portray this through toothache animations and commoners sweeping sand off. Rough teeth are freaky dentists oh my all right Ooh, last two here we go Welcome to Wine in Ancient Egypt. Ooh, the contrasted beer. Here we go. When the god Horus lost his eye in a war with Seth, the ancient Egyptians believed the eye turned into a vine, and the vine's tears became wine. <laughs> okay. Early texts dating back to 3150 BCE contain the hieroglyph for vine. Regarded as extremely valuable, wine was highly sought after by the elite. It was also an essential part of many religious ceremonies. Hmm, wonder why. A millennia-old tradition. Grape cultivation and wine production was regimented in the way typical of ancient Egyptian bureaucracy. Egyptians kept careful records of winemakers, which they clearly identified on labels. Every landowner with a modicum of self-respect usually kept a vineyard. This held particularly true in the regions of the Fayum and the Nile Delta. Hmm. Documentation shows that only certain craftsfolk were allowed to provide the containers required. Oh. Egyptians had different kinds of wines, most of which ranged in quality from good to very good. The sweet Shade, to which honey had been added. The soft Nejem, obtained by drying the grapes in the sun. The ma, reserved for religious ceremonies. And finally there was the peor, the mediocre rated wine, resulting from the second pressing of grapes and reserved for a less discerning palate. <laughs> it's funny. All right, let's just quickly go back to this. Okay, I accidentally skipped over that. Too Documentation fast. shows that only certain craftsfolk were allowed to provide the containers required to store and transport wine. Oh, okay. That wine. and rigorous quality control checks established for every step of wine production shows that ancient Egyptians knew that the quality and longevity of wine could easily be affected by any number of variables, which oh. they paid careful attention to. So they're a big alcoholic race. That's what I'm, uh, not race. Oh, yes, race, yeah. Um... That's what we're finding out. Yeah. Well, that's probably why they're so spiritual, because they were all, like, drunk all the time. Oil. It ends here. Persians who ruled Egypt in the late period meet the match. That was very nice. Okay, so Alexander protected. Oh, usurp. Not usurp, but brought back. Um, brought back Egypt from control it's so interesting it's so important to have like a military force you got to realize that because like this amazing civilization that we're talking about right now got destroyed because they didn't have a strong enough military force the Persians came in and destroyed them so like it is what it is you need uh, sometimes you do need power to keep power in check Welcome to Oil in Ancient Egypt. Castor, sesame, and moringa were the source of the most common oils in ancient Egypt. Oil was used for various purposes. Cosmetics, medical treatments, nutrition, perfume, athletics, and rituals, to name a few. The team decided to use oil 
as an explosive to add more gameplay opportunities for the player. <laughs> That's funny. Ancient Egyptians originally used castor oil in wick lamps, but also for cosmetics, such as facial and hair treatments. There is mention in some papyrus of castor oil being prescribed to treat constipation and help pregnant women. Castor beans were found in ancient Egyptian tombs as early as 4000 BCE. Castor oil was made by pressing the beans from the plant of the same name. Hmm. That's cool. Makes sense. People still use castor oil to this day. Olive trees were present though scarce in ancient Egypt's early history. And olives were mostly imported from Syria and Palestine. Their use and cultivation remained uncommon until the mass arrival of Greek settlers during the reign of the Ptolemies, when demand increased sharply. Olive trees were normally found in the region of the Fayum and the lands surrounding Alexandria. How interesting is that that they say like place like Syria, uh, because those places now today are like not what they not what they are in the game. You know, uh, time is ticking for everyone and like in like a thousand years if we're still around maybe america will be the new syria and then syria will have brought back its you know its might it's funny it's really just land like people are just like we're all just warring for controls of land to create quote civilized uncivilized uh, societies but yeah until next time daily life is done skipped over a couple of them uh sped up because it was like ah those weren't that ah, interesting uh, but yeah, we got Romans last, and we will call this one complete. So yeah, until next time, drink some castor oil. Stay healthy. Stay cute. Take it easy.